My name is Sunday Okabitis. I'm CEO of Golden Frog. Um, what is your role with okay. Viper VPN? Okay, I am uh, CEO of Golden Frog. It's the company that owns Viper VPN. Um, we started that company in 2009. I've been with the company from the very beginning. Um, as we moved into rolling out a VPN, I was part of that. Um, and growing up through the company over the years. So my I serve the role right now of uh, CEO. Just going back to the history, when was this company, when, when was Golden Frog formed? Golden Frog was formed in 2009. Uh, we rolled out Viper VPN shortly thereafter. Um, and really, you know, Viper VPN was really a political response to what was going on in the United States at the time. Um, we were starting to understand there was a lot of surveillance going on by the U.S. government and realizing we attempted to work through the political process of talking to the people in Congress, talking to the regulatory bodies and testifying, saying these were threats to people's privacy. And they literally told us, well, no one's really come up here to talk about privacy ever. You're the first company that's talked about privacy on the internet. And it was a foreign concept. And we started realizing that um, in Washington, D.C., there was very little understanding of what was going on. And we lost faith that through the political process that they would provide solutions to protect the citizens. So we said, we need to build a solution to protect um, people's privacy. And that's when we started Viper VPN. Um, at that time, there was there were some VPN companies already. Um, but really, our vision then was to modernize it and make it easy for people to, to protect themselves. And that's kind of was our genesis was really kind of a political response to what um, was going on on the internet that we saw was happening before people really were aware, you know, as Snowden came out and other things and other disclosures have come out, but we, we, we felt that early on that, that it was going to be an issue and we need to help protect people. This is, if, if, if my research is correct, this is about 20 years ago now. Is that, is that right? No. It, it, what is 20, when we were founded? No, when all this happened with... Uh, what was it called? Level uh, 64A or whatever? No, that was about, and that wasn't 20 years ago. Um, room, I think 641A in, in San Francisco was roughly 05, 06, 2005, 2006. Okay. I don't have it on top of my head. Um, those disclosures started coming out then. So uh, it wasn't 20 years ago, but it's definitely been some time. Um, and we had a period of years where we were trying to work through the political process to, to say this is wrong and we need to we need to create legislation to prevent it, mm -hmm. but feeling there was a deaf ear, we said, well, listen, um, we need to build the tools ourselves. They're not going to protect us. Okay, that, that wasn't on my question list. Yeah. I just wanted to. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to hear yeah. it because yeah. I want to make sure I understand everything that's going on. Um, let's just ask some other simple questions because some of these are going to be edited. Okay. Uh, how many co-workers are employed by Viper VPN? We're at about uh, about 80 right now. Okay. Yeah, total all company that work on. Um, we have multiple brands and multiple companies we work on, but we have about 80 people right now. Okay, here's another simple question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the really the one best thing about Viper VPN in your opinion? The one best thing about us and Viper VPN is that you can trust the people behind it. We're real people. We talk about the issues. We're a very mission-driven company. Um, all of our employees, including myself, are very uh, aligned to protecting the Internet. We feel like we've been talking about these issues for years. There's been a lot of VPN companies founded since then. But I think it, for us, um, the one thing you, you should know about us is you can trust us. We take it very seriously, and we're transparent. We're here. Um, so I think uh, consumers should trust us, and, and, and we, should, we, do, we work hard to build that trust, and we, we're very aware of it. I haven't written this down, but this is something else I've noticed because I've, I've gone to your website, mm -hmm. and I see your faces. I've been on other VPN websites, yeah. and the people are anonymous. What advantages do you get from that? I think uh, being transparent about who you are, why you're providing a product to consumers is how you should do business today. I think all companies should do that. 
just say who they are, where they are, what do they stand for, and that way people can feel comfortable, they can trust the company. So for us, it's just core to who we are. We've, we have, from the very beginning, um, been vocal about issues, put our name to it, and we're not, you know, a, a nameless, faceless marketing company that is providing the service. And I think that's what's my concerns about the, the trend I'm seeing in the VPN industry is that where you have folks that have rushed in the industry that don't care about privacy. It's not core to their mission. They're not uh, transparent about what, what the real reasons are. And I think that puts consumers in a tough spot. So we're trying to build that trust by, by being transparent, talking about who we are. I think it's something that's been core from day one. Looking from the consumer's perspective, why should people buy Viper VPN instead of another provider? Uh, a couple reasons. Um, I think that you can trust us. We're, we're transparent with our policies and how we deal with data. We've done that from day one. I think that we are very focused on the performance of the service and, and how we do that is how we build our VPN network. We're the only provider that runs its own servers, which gets us two things. Obviously, we can build security and processes that we rely upon ourselves to protect our customers. We're not relying upon third parties to do that for us. And when you have third parties in your business, then you have to be able to trust them. And we try to eliminate that as much as possible as a core principle. So we're running our own servers, we get, we feel like increased security and control, but we also get more performance and, and, and reliability behind the service. So we like to roll our own and, and, and rely upon ourselves so we can deliver better. That's a big differentiator between us and our competitors. That's really good. Why did you choose the name of this company? That's interesting. Um, Golden Frog was chosen um, because of a, a, a bar in Panama that my parents went to when they went through there in the 60s and they went back there for a internet conference Strangely enough, the circle is complete, come back so many 40 years later to go to an internet conference, and they went back to the same bar, and it was called the Golden Frog, and they just loved the name. And it turns out that we didn't recognize that the Golden Frog is the national animal of Panama. They have a whole holiday for the country. They shut, the, they have parades. It's, we did not realize at the time, that's how we chose Golden Frog, is um, kind of looking back in the history and just liking the name. And then Viper VPN, um, you know, I guess we, we've stuck with the animal concept. We like the, the, the snake of sort of like protection and um, sort of this, you know, um, a, kind of more of an aggressive, like we're going to protect the data and, and keep people out and, and be there for you. So that's how we started with Viper um, uh, way back when. This was 10 years ago. We didn't have a vision where it would be today, but that's how we started. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a few other okay. technical questions. How many servers do you have? Gosh, we have over, I think it's over 2,000. Is that, I think, oh. the current number? Um, uh, the current number, it is, changes as we've grown, obviously. Um, but we're really proud that we've done that ourselves. Those are, those are our servers. We own those servers. We secure those servers. Um, no one can get in those servers except for us. And so that's a big number to protect. It's grown quite a bit. It used to be a lot less than that. So we're pretty happy that it's at that, that number now. You have such a massive amount of servers. How many customers do you have? Clients? So that's something, you know, we don't talk too much about. Um, you know, we're not, we're not quite to a million yet, but we're getting there. Um, you know, I would love to say millions, but we've been very focused on paid customers and not free customers. Okay. And so uh, we're not quite under a million, I would say, is, is a good number. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a legitimate number that we, that we have, and it's, it's paid customers, and we're very focused on that, that part of the market. I'm one of them. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, what, what are the most important points or facts about VPN? Sorry, I'm gonna say it again. What are the most important points or facts about Viper VPN from your opinion? And, you know, I think, again, um, we're a mission-driven company. 
and we have been talking about this. A lot, I think a lot of companies have imitated it, which is nice. But we've been we were the first to talk about privacy, security, freedom, and that's what a VPN delivers. And I think that for us is talking through that and being very mission driven and focused on that that influences everything we do is 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 one of our best qualities. Yeah, sure. I think our our applications are modern and compete and are easy to use, right? But I think it's really more about what our core principles are that should lead to people trusting us. Um, for many years, we talked about how it's hard to be anonymous on the internet. We were very out front on that. It took a lot of a lot of criticism for that. But I think what you see as a company, we are wanting to put our opinion out there to to educate people and to also build trust. Um, and what we're doing because we're always focused on our mission of throughout all the companies we have here. We have multiple internet companies, but I think is unique for VPN companies. We have multiple internet businesses and across all of those, we have core principles of really preserving and keeping the internet open. So people can communicate. That's what it's about. You know, people talking to people. So um, we have that, I think is our core mission is, is important. Mm -hmm. We don't have to record this one, but can I just ask you something? and freedom and freedom of expression versus control. And I think that's what we're seeing. That that dynamic's playing out across Iran, China, yeah, yeah. Russia. Yeah. And that, that dynamic's been playing out since the beginning of time probably, right? The internet's just the latest expression of that. And so from my perspective, I lean to openness, um, lead to openness of communication and, and having due process in place to deal with surveillance and things that need to be surveilled and have reasons, good reasons to do, do so in a process to go through that. Mm -hmm. That's where I stand on it. But yeah, I, I just want to ask you that one because I wasn't going to ask direct questions about Islamic State when we were recording it. Yeah. It's quite clear. Let's just go on to this because it says here, okay. what are you okay now? Recording, yeah. Yeah, so what about services for streaming which bypass geographical uh, barriers? What are the costs and benefits for doing that? Costs and benefits of streaming. So, yeah, that's definitely a use case of VPNs um, that we've seen using a, a different IP to to uh, get access to different services. I think what you're seeing is companies trying to balkanize the internet, um, and we really feel like the internet's not owned by anybody in some way as a principle. It's it is sort of the ocean. We talk about that in our vision paper. It's the ocean's used for transaction of ships, transportation, all kinds of transactions, but it's not owned by anybody, right? And so you'll see companies um, and governments try to uh, balkanize and split up what is supposed to be open. It's an open protocol. It's meant to facilitate communication. It's not meant to be a TV service, and they're trying to wedge that into controlling the Internet for their, for their purposes, and I think that that's where it's difficult for consumers to feel, um, you know, that they're using they're using the internet against them in some ways to, to control what needs to happen. So, streaming is an is a, is a embodiment of that. I think, um, and I think there's other ways that they could control and lock down their services, um, so people wouldn't have to use VPNs. But um, I think it's it's not the intent of the internet to be closed. It's meant to be open. And I think try that you go against that core principle. I think that's where you have the tension. Eric, we mentioned a couple of issues. How will this VPN go down with other commercial operations? I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, go down. What do you mean by go down? If you, if you let's take for example uh, a World Cup event. So okay. you've got Heineken beer. Okay or something else, and they are showing this in another country, and they're streaming, they're going to undermine other commercial enterprises in other areas. That's potentially the problem. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I, I feel like, again, back to what I said before, is that they have it backwards. They're trying to use the internet to control what needs to be seen, I think they can do a better job on their end with how they control what's seen. And 
you want to use a tool that's meant to be open and try to close it, that's where you have this tension between that two and you're going to have these gray areas. And that's where it, it's difficult for companies like us that, that want to provide a service where you can go anywhere on the internet, any country, you know, um, that's how the internet's supposed to be and then they want to slice it up. And I think that they have other means to do that. They may be more expensive, they may be harder for them to do, but it's sort of the perils of trying to take a, a tool that's meant to, that, le that is built on openness and try and make it closed. Let's just go back to this thing about geographical boundaries because the question is, here is, how will this go down in China and other countries where strict controls are the norm? Well, how is it going to go down for us? We're going to keep fighting to keep that open, you know, um, as a principle. And so that's, that's the battle that's happening right now in a lot of ways where... Um, you know, governments want to restrict technology, citizens want to want to keep things open, and then where are we in the middle to help? Where, which side do we lean on? We lean on openness. And so, uh, yeah, the Chinese government does not like our service, clearly. They blocked it today. They're, they're even as we speak, working to, to block it. So, and we're working to unblock it. So, I really, I think that's back to our core mission. We just, we believe uh, in the power of the internet. We don't believe it's owned by anybody. It shouldn't be restricted. And let the information flow. Okay. Next question is uh, to do mm -hmm. with this. What services are available to protect from surveillance? Well, obviously, a VPN is, is a great start, right? But, you know, a lot of this, when we say surveillance, you know, I think a lot of what I'm seeing that consumers are, are addressing is not necessarily governmental surveillance, there's surveillance by the big corporations, whether it's their ISP. Um, there is more information than you would ever think that an ISP can see about you and the advertising, the intrusion in their life. So I think there's um, a lot of, when you say surveillance, a lot of concern about corporate surveillance. You know, I think a VPN helps, helps that. I think, obviously, um, I love services like DuckDuckGo. I think browsers that are privacy-oriented, you know, like Firefox. But if people think that these consumer-grade services are going to defeat targeted surveillance on you by a government, I think they're mistaken. You know, if they, you know, if they want to find you, they will find you. Um, but what we're really trying to defeat is that the, really the mass, the, ma the surveillance that's not targeted on individuals, that is, it, that is with outside due process, that corporations are playing in gray areas. And due to the lack of legislation, Effectively, citizens have to arm up and protect themselves because the governments aren't protecting them. Those are the areas I think that that, that people can really um, use some of these tools. But if you're saying surveillance that's targeted on you, the individual, I think that's these services don't do that and don't have, would not set that expectation. Okay, ne next question. Who are your main competitors and why? Gosh, there's so many VPNs these days, right? Um, it's evolved in the beginning there was a set of competitors and they went, they went to the wayside. Um, I would say kind of the original VPN companies have either been um, bought or consolidated or sold to much bigger billion dollar companies that, that have other uses for them. So that, that, that has changed over the years. What I've seen in the last two or three years is more marketing driven companies with incredibly large marketing budget budgets that I have come into the industry. So they're not mission-focused companies. They're not uh, as focused on privacy. There are still some out there, and they're smaller, that, 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 I, that I do respect. Um, but what I've seen in, in the competitive landscape, that there's a, there's a, the ones that we're competing against are the ones that have come more recently and are putting large marketing budgets behind it. I think that's what I'm seeing uh, in the competitive, and that's probably changed the last two or three years. It's going back to the criminal activity and things like that. Okay. Like the classic example of El Chapo. Okay. All right. Yeah. Doesn't a VPN service automatically support and facilitate criminal and criminal activity? Uh, support and facilitate. I, I would if if a VPN supports and facilitates criminal activity, so then so does a road, then so do the power lines, and then so do all the infrastructure. I think it's it's um, it's really about you know do you do we participate in 
um, in that, no, I don't think so. I think we are protecting people's privacy, giving them a tool to protect them from all the things on the internet. And there's, it doesn't matter what uh, a service is, it can be used for nefarious purposes, whether it's storage of files. And so I don't feel like we're facilitating or soliciting that. And that's certainly not a business where we talk about or market to. We really are focused on protecting people and creating openness. I think that's where we're at. Um, and I think that's where, <clears throat> you know, as we talk to people in Congress, we talk to politicians, that's what we talk about is they have that same perception, well, this must be used for, for bad. That privacy, if you want to be private, you must be doing something wrong. And, you know, everyone says that. Well, you know, everyone says, I don't have anything to hide. Well, like, why don't, why don't you look, let me go look through your closet a little bit? You probably wouldn't like someone showing up your house doing that. Why would, why won't you let me just look through your car? Well, I don't want someone looking through my car. Like, you know, people that say they have nothing to hide, we have a desire for privacy. I think that's what we're, we all need that and should expect that. And that's what we're protecting. And um, I think that that is where, you know, we try to educate <clears throat> politicians and that, that, just because you want to be private does not mean you're doing something wrong. Those things are not related because those that want to do wrong will find any tool for any means to do it, and it's not our job to prevent that. Yeah, this, this, this next one was really on that because it says here, some politicians demand a clear confirmation of the identities of users on the Internet. This is to prevent fake news, sexual harassment, violent threats, pedophilia, and much more. And here's a quote from the Israeli ambassador from the United Nations. And I heard that direct when he was speaking live. And he said, freedom of speech is not freedom of hate. Is this not also giving up freedom if we control that? I think so. I'm an American. I think that um, freedom of speech is very important to us as Americans. It's not... An, it's not uh, unfortunately, every country doesn't have share that belief, right? And so um, that that's where it gets in a situation where you do have people, um, again, wanting to put restrictions, identification on that. And does that inhibit freedom of speech? People not feel comfortable to talk. And that's where it gets to me to be a situation where where do you stand as a company? Do you gonna you gonna decide on openness or are you gonna decide on restriction? And I think that we're gonna decide on openness. But as Americans, we definitely um, core value ours is freedom of speech. And people can say what they want. Words don't hurt you. It's actions, right? And you know we're gonna. You know I think that getting that on the table and talking about more is an important issue. Like where where is the line? Other countries have said particularly in the UK, like they, they, need, to, they need to know where, where people are going and things need to be blocked. And, and I think we're going to be on the side of fighting against that. Um, and that hasn't happened here in the United States. I think there would be a lot of uh, pushback for that. I've seen it happen in other countries. Australia is another country where there's a lot of restrictions being put on the Internet and what people can do. And I think it comes down to where, what each country wants to do. Um, if we feel like we're in that jurisdiction and we have to do it, we'll do that. But that hasn't been the case yet. So... What is your opinion on the current state of the VPN space? In my opinion, the current state of the VPN space, um, it is, it is I, I think it's been declining in terms of the trust by consumers for the overall space. Um, I talked about in the last two or three years, we've seen the marketers rush in and buy VPN companies that don't really care about privacy and they put a lot of money in the space creating to, there's a lot of false advertising, there's a lot of people saying they do X, like they don't log or how they treat data just to get great confidence and trust, but they actually really don't. And that, that, that erosion of, of trust, and if one VPN company does it and another does it, it, it affects the whole industry. And so uh, I'm disappointed in the state of the industry right now, to be honest. I think it's, while it's good, I think there's more VPNs than ever. I think that the, my concerns is it will be, it will, the confidence will erode in VPNs and people won't use them. And then 
in that world, what's left for them? You know, I think we need to do a better job as an industry. Um, we worked together last year to try to establish some principles. I'm still working with some other folks in the VPN industry to help work on that. Um, and we're not done yet, but um, we need to not complain, but lead and say this is what it needs to be so that it can help consumers make good decisions and, and, and allow companies to, um, the good ones, to come out and be more vocal about what needs to be done. So I think it's, it's, it's eroded. I, I think confidence in the VPN industry has eroded, unfortunately. Um, and I think we can turn that around because if we don't have VPNs and encryption, what's left? Okay. You know. Actually, the next question is more appropriate for the data center. Okay. It says here, one for the data center. How are your servers different from other VPN services? You might want to ask, uh, answer that here because you don't know what the noise uh, level in your... Um, I'll answer it here. I think, it, I think um, how our servers are different than other VPN providers because we own them. We control them, not just software rise and access, physically, the security. We, we are... Our whole architecture is about controlling from the server all the way to the application and be able to do that and not relying upon any 30 third parties. When we're relying upon third parties in the data center, uh, power and some cooling and network that we plug into, but when it leaves our servers, it's encrypted through that network. And so when you leave us, there's no third parties and we, we encrypt everything from, from us to, um, to you, and that's an important principle for us. That's how we're really different. Um, I wish more companies would do it, and make those investments, because um, I think it's a better model. I think you saw NordVPN was was hacked and breached because of their data center provider, and that's the deal. They relied upon all these third parties, spinning them up, spinning up servers, and they will say they protect them. They will say one thing, and another thing happens. How many times does this have to happen? So, I think if we um, Try to try to talk about getting a core principle of getting more control over the VPN and being uh, VPN servers. That's a better thing for consumers. I think being more open about co companies talking about what third parties they rely upon and what third parties they don't. I think that'd be good for the industry. All right, I, I I've got another question that's coming up now. Okay. I was working for an automotive R and D company, and uh, we went on a um, commercial visit to China. The company was Vienna Engineering. Mm -hmm. And the commercial attaché, the Austrian commercial attaché, when I landed at the airport in Shanghai, he says, John, come with me. He took me outside the door and said, John, whatever you do, don't start your computer, your laptop in the Chinese companies because they got 30,000 people who are working for the government, hacking in to your computer to get your IP. Now, we talk about freedom. My question is, should people be free to hack? Free to hack, I mean, that's sort of a, <laughs> put those two terms together, I don't know if I've heard that. Um, and what's hacking? I mean, hacking can be tinkering and playing around with stuff too, but if you're saying hacking is inherently illegal, yeah, I don't think that we should say, yeah, it's, it's okay to do illegal things. But hacking on things is, okay, there's a lot of positives to that. But if you're saying that's what it means, free to hack, I think that, you know, um, people should be free to secure themselves too from hackers. I think that's, be very aware. I don't think that it's a, as a principle to say illegal hacking is, is, people should be free to do that, no. Yeah, the, the big issue on this one is yeah. intellectual property. Yeah. Because people come up with creative ideas. Yeah. You know, for the automotive industry, as I, as yeah. I said, it might be in the medical industry. Yeah. It might be in other industries. And then you've got these other people that are hacking in and stealing the ideas and creating them themselves. Um, in, in Austria, we have a wonderful ski lift company. Yeah. And the Chinese copied it absolutely exactly and have got exactly the same ski lift operating in China with no knowledge at all of the foundation company. Yeah. Should that be allowed? Yeah, I think that with the Chinese, we're seeing, um, 
in my opinion, you know, uh, there's character issues, there's moral issues with them as a country, what their culture is, you know, how they treat their people, the surveillance of their people, how do they treat other countries and, you know, what's mine is mine, what yours is mine, sort of attitude that the Chinese have for the rest of the world, I, you know, is concerning, but, you know, I guess I have, um, talked about Stalin earlier, right? There's been regimes where it been awful atrocities, but ultimately I think we have, uh, you know, over, over, over time gotten better as humanity, and I hope that wins out, because I think some of the core principles of the Chinese I don't agree with. And I hope, I, but I trust that they won't win out, that the better, the better ideas and the better culture and the better morals will win out. Um, Otherwise, this, this whole world, globe is going to be very different if we operate. Everyone operates like the Chinese, so okay. um, we'll see. The stories to be told. So, something else has just crossed my mind. If you don't mind me asking this one, um, again, the Austrian Chamber of Commerce, they they had a, a presentation, convention, if you like, mm -hmm. and the Hay Group were there, and the Hay Group, which do a lot of um, consulting for companies and all the rest of it made a very big point. In Austria, 94 to 96% of all family businesses go insolvent by the third generation. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. you're, for me, I've got the impression that you're doing really well. What have you learned from your dad? Well, I would say my dad and my mom, because they're okay, really co-founders, yeah. They are um, an equal. Um, I've learned that, you know, these businesses were started with $10,000. And they weren't started with venture capital money or outside money. It was a husband and wife that could work together and, you know, believed in each other and, and, and had the right idea and it worked. And so I think we have a lot of kind of no excuses attitude around here, which is really good as a company that, you know, they did it with such little, we have, as we have more abundance, you know, there's no excuse why we can't do more. And, and hard work and being committed to each other and, and working together, there's a lot you can do. And I think that that's what I've learned from them. I think that spirit is throughout all the companies of, you know, kind of that blue collar approach to it where vis-a-vis -vis, where you see other tech companies is go to outside parties, get a lot of money, and it either fails or it does well and they sell it. And we've built it more from the ground up. Okay. Um, with a lot of people who have been here, we have 20 year plus people who are proud of that, you know, and so that have come along with us. So I've learned that um, if you just have belief in each other and, and a small amount of resources, you can make a lot of happen. And that's how Viper VPN started. We started spinning up a server overnight like took us took our technical guys like three or four days to do the first server mm -hmm. you know and, and then they say what are we going to do next and that's how it was birthed it was just a small amount of resources and let's put it in the market let's start trying to protect people and it didn't start with some multi-million dollar plan it started with just setting up one server and going from there and so i think that sort of attitude is what i've learned from them is is to to be nimble and and you don't need a you don't need a lot to do a lot you know i think that that gets lost sometimes and so we have that spirit around here which i'm i'm proud i think we still have that here we still have we're doing well as a company but we're always thinking what's next what are we going to do next and so that's the opportunity but i do very aware of in family companies you know the um what is it is it um the yeah the third generation and things go away but you know listen how many internet companies are 25 years old? We just cel celebrated our That's 25th. Right. I mean, there's, it's just, you know, these types of businesses, internet businesses can be very more short lived. And so we're, we're more focused in the next, you know, three to five years than that far down the yeah, road. Because on, on this issue, mm -hmm. um, because of the seminars or the congresses that I was at, mm -hmm. in fact, I met one family business guy. Yeah. And it was quite interesting. He forced his son to go out and work in other countries for five or six years. Mm -hmm. And now his son is working for his company and being very successful mm -hmm. because of the experience he had mm -hmm. in other, other companies. Um, 
the other thing that was mentioned to me. Um, there's a big difference between basically German, Austrian companies, Central European business mentality to American business mentality. The Hay Group was, were arguing that in America, many of the companies form their companies, build them up, and after 10 years, their aim is to sell on the stock market. That's right. So how do you see these two issues? Is it good to send your sons out? For it is. Years? Yeah, it is, and, that, and that's what I did. I, I you know, um, practiced law in the Bay Area and uh, came back to the companies really doing focus on the legal side and then expanded and brought but brought that into the companies uh, worked at multiple firms had done that um, and that's kind of where I started and I think that's where you'll see us ha have a strong um, view of how we do things Pol you know legally policy wise we've always is a core principle how we do that I think that's um, I've brought some of that in myself but yeah I think it's it's great for people to go get that outside experience come back in I think that helps us um, it really does. Made me feel happy you know, you've actually said that. Yeah. Kind of this theory. Yeah. You're kind of uh, rubber stamping it. Yeah. It's I, good. I, yeah, I think it is good. Um, it 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 helps you know, um, and also, but some some of it is you know, if you're in these business long enough, you, you grow up with them and, and evolve. <laughs> all, all I'm not the only person that's worked here that's started in one position and gone to another. We've had that all over the company. Yeah. And so I think that's sort of been our story is, is you know, a bunch of like-minded people that view, view working here as an opportunity and, and run with it. And it leads to doing a bunch of different things.